All right. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to those joining us from the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. My name is Bruce Murray, and I serve as chair of the Democrats Abroad Global Progressive Caucus, also known as ProDA. I am joined today by our vice chair, Sue Alksness in Canada, and our monthly Mondays for Progressive Minds co-chairs, Betsy Atora in Finland. She also chairs our Global Seniors Caucus and Daniel Stein in Mexico. Justin Hart, the Global Youth Caucus member, also joins us where he resides in the Czech Republic. Okay. As former Minnesota Senator Paul Wellstone often noted, when we all do better, we all do better. Senior Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders puts it this way. Take a look around you, find someone you don't know, maybe someone who kind of doesn't look like you. Are you willing to fight for that person as much as you're willing to fight for yourself? If you're willing to do that together, we will transform this country. That seems right on target to me, and I expect it does for all of us here today. While others seek to limit opportunity and attack social security, we strive for equal opportunity and to expand social security for all, and we will not rest until we have succeeded. That is what motivated the overwhelming majority of those who completed our 2023 ProDA survey to rank combating wealth inequality as one of our highest priorities. We know that when we step up to the plate to improve the quality of life for our fellow citizens, we build a stronger community. We also motivate people to cast their votes, help us win elections, and it puts us in a better position to win the day, not just for a few of us, but for all of us. Well, with that in mind, I want to say that we are going to uh, turn it over to Candace Karastan, our global chair, who really works hard to mobilize Americans abroad in support of common sense public policies and Democrats who support them. Candace? Hi, Bruce. I'm, I'm um, our vice chair, Sue Alksness, and I understand that our chair, um, Candace Karastan, is having some technical difficulties. So I'm going to quickly share that um, Democrats Abroad is working around uh, the globe and uh, that Candace often shares the importance of everyone getting involved and that the Democratic Party um, is not just about uh, our um, the, the, the high profile uh, leaders and movers and shakers, but people who make up the grassroots of the party and are the individuals and that that all of us here today in this in this meeting are the party together. Um, I also want to share that we have in Democrats Abroad some very exciting initiatives within teams that focus on states, and uh, um, we can drop a link in the chat about our state teams, but we do not yet have a state team for Massachusetts. These teams work on uh, electoral issues within, this, within the states, um, help invite candidates in those states to come to uh, speak with voters around the world, and they also work on uh, voter rights and enfranchisement issues um, within the states. In some states, you're not, even though you're a U.S. citizen, you're not allowed to vote if you never resided in the U.S. Uh, in other states, we're permitted to vote at the state level, but not at the federal level, whereas uh, oftentimes our federal election uh, rights are affected by decisions made within uh, the state legislatures and courts, for instance. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that, we encourage you to go to our state teams page and uh, get involved. It's um, very important work that needs to happen now. In fact, we have some big elections, a uh, big election happening in Wisconsin for the Supreme Court, which could decide uh, the future of some very, very important issues that we're all that we're all tracking, including woman's right to control her own body and uh, the environment. All right, so I'll ask Betsy to please introduce our first uh, our first speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Sue, for Cantus. Uh, today, our monthly Monday discussion centers on tackling wealth inequality from cradle to rocking chair. The economy is not working for most Americans and particularly for those in vulnerable populations. Indicators of macroeconomic performance point to an economy that is not 
operating at its full potential. The main task facing progressives concerned about our economic present and future is to increase pay and the labor share of income while bringing more people into the labor market, especially those in marginalized communities. This task can be accomplished through bold pro-worker policies that lift pay and improve working conditions in general, and through policies that target more vulnerable workers and communities in particular. In combination with policies that build worker power and direct action, programs that reaffirm the role of public investment and government spending can be, can be leveraged to raise the economy to its full productive potential to meet the challenges of everything from climate change to crumbling infrastructure. Only then can we begin to remedy the 35 plus years of wage stagnation and worker disempowerment while promoting sustainable growth. This evening, we have the distinct pleasure of having as our first speaker, Representative Ayanna Presley, who is joining us during a busy day on the Hill. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley is an activist, a legislator, a survivor, and the first woman of color to will be elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Throughout her career as a public service servant, Congresswoman Presley has fought to ensure that those closest to the pain are closest to the power, driving and informing policymaking. Throughout her time in Congress, Congresswoman Presley has been a champion for justice and healing, reproductive justice, justice for immigrants, consumer justice, justice for seniors, justice for workers, justice for survivors of sexual violence, justice for the formerly and currently incarcerated individual, and healing for those who have experienced trauma. Any questions you might have will be taken after each guest has spoken, and we ask that you please use the Q&A function to type your question. I have the pleasure of handing over to Representative Ayanna Presley for her presentation. Thank you, Congressman Presley. The floor is yours. Hi, Betsy. It's me again. <laughs> um, I, I've just learned that uh, Congresswoman Presley actually is not yet on the call. It's a busy day on the Hill. And so um, we're just waiting for her to uh, to tune in. So um, I think. Um, we might uh, check and see if our other speaker, Alex Lawson is, I know Alex is ah. here today and Alex is good to go. So we're just so grateful to you, Alex, um, for that. And um, uh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll be looking uh, for uh, notice as soon as Representative Presley gets here and can let us know um, what time she has available. And we really appreciate Alex, your flexibility. Thank you for helping us out. So um, with, uh, without further ado, I will introduce Alex very quickly. I'll just say that I had the pleasure to meet Alex in 2019 when Democrats Abroad um, was hold, having its global meeting in Washington, DC. And we were working on a resolution to support Medicare for all. And um, we were also collecting healthcare stories and working with public citizen um, on uh, on uh, campaign work for Medicare for All and asked for a speaker who could uh, speak at a progressive caucus event uh, on that topic. And Alex Lawson was suggested and very kindly joined us uh, for that uh, event, which um, was well attended. And we happily, I think, were the first or second state party to pass a resolution in support of Medicare for all at that uh, at that time. And uh, appreciate Alex uh, joining us. Alex is the executive director of Social Security Works, the convening member of the Strengthened Social Security Coalition. And that coalition is made up of over 340 national and state organizations representing over 50 million Americans. And today, um, Alex is going to talk to us about expansion of social security. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, and obviously, when uh, Congresswoman Presley um, joins, uh, she can just take the time and then I can um, start again. I'm very flexible here. Um, 
So um, first, just thanks for the invitation to talk about this. I want to talk about specifically the Expand Social Security Act, but I also want to talk a little bit more broadly about what we're seeing uh, with the centrality of uh, attacks on social security, um, attacks that actually mirror um, the attacks on retirement security we're see seeing in France. So I feel like this is also a unique venue uh, for an understanding that you know what you're seeing is a coordinated attack by the billionaire class. Uh, and they only have one idea, right? It's just steal our money. Uh, they call it raising the retirement age, but in fact, it's, the, it's just a benefit cut. Um, the way that benefits are calculated when that uh, age goes up and has nothing to do with when you retire, it's just when you get your full benefits. So when they're saying raising it, all they're saying is cut benefits. Um, in uh, the U.S., you know, the proposal is a three-year increase, which is a 21% benefit cut. So really like process that that's what that means uh, that, they're per, that they're pushing. Um, you're seeing this popular backlash in France over the exact same, um, uh, the exact same push, right? You have um, a billionaire class that is saying we're going to, we can't afford uh, for people to have retirement security. So uh, we're going to um, cut their benefits. And at its root, it's just important to always remember, this is just basically rich people saying, we don't want to pay more in taxes, so we're going to cut your benefits. Uh, and the way to defend against that is to point out really straightforwardly that the other way you do it is, no, we're going to actually increase social security benefits and we're going to pay for it by asking millionaires and billionaires to pay the same rate as the rest of us on all of their income, just like the rest of us. And unsurprisingly, when you ask the American people, you know, hey, which one would you like? Would you rather that you and your uh, family's benefits are cut so that ri these rich people don't have to pay more in taxes? Or would you rather your benefits are actually increased because they're far too low for millions of Americans? Uh, and the only people who would pay more in taxes are making more than $250,000 a year under the Senate version, the Expand Social Security Act. Um, that's Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. It's a really great bill, increases benefits for everyone by $200 a month. Um, that's a very like understandable benefit. Um, everyone's benefits go up by $200 a month. Uh, it also has some targeted expansions in it as well, uh, and it pays for it all by having um, people above 250000 paying in on all of their income, both earned and unearned, into the Social Security uh, Trust Fund. So it's a really fantastic bill. Uh, in the House, there's a very similar bill John Larson carries, um, and it actually raises taxes only on those making above 400000 um, and would um, expand benefits. So one of the things that's really important about um, the, the fight right now is that Social Security, we knew it would, and it has taken a uh, central role in the debt ceiling fight. Um, and you can tell how important it is to the Republicans. Uh, they have one plan, hold the world economy hostage uh, to get to push through cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Uh, it's what they did, they tried to do under Obama. It's what they always try to do. Um, you can tell it's what they are always trying to do because they keep going on television and being like, it's definitely not what we're trying to do. I don't know if you all have seen this, but like cable after cable interview where they say we're not doing it, while at the same time, they're actually in venues, presidential uh, hopefuls, saying we are definitely going to cut your social security benefits, right? Mike Pence has said that, Nikki Haley has said that. Um, and the White House, the Biden White House has really positioned itself very strongly uh, as um, saying absolutely no benefit cuts to social security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, a clean debt ceiling raise, and we're not even going to um, enter into any negotiation uh, about benefit cuts. The debt ceiling needs to be raised cleanly. Um, 
we think that the a lot of the political pressure that the Republicans um, that the Republicans are facing, which is why they're backpedaling so much, is because of the universal popularity of the idea of expanding social security. It's actually more powerful. People have uh, more of a powerful uh, emotional response, according to the polling, especially independents, when we counterpoint the Republican plans to cut social security uh, with the Democratic plans to expand social security. Um, and I think I might just toss it back over to the MC uh, for the Congresswoman, and then I can um, maybe take questions at the, after it all, or I can keep talking. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, that was a great start to this guest speaker portion of our event. Seems as though we are getting close to connecting with the Congresswoman. She uh, seems to be ready in a waiting room. And I'd like to ask uh, Karen, uh, is it possible to put her on the screen now or do we need to um, wait just a little We're longer? still working on that. That's All so right. please. Aha, so I can, patient. I can just keep talking um, and you can uh, talk in my ear when the tech, uh, this is always the way that um, it happens with technology. Um, so yes, in the house, um, um, Representative Jan Schakowsky has introduced the Expand Social Security Act, the companion bill to um, the Sanders-Warren bill in the Senate. Um, we think that for all of the fights, and this is what makes my job uh, somewhat easy, is that the American people are so firmly on our side when it comes to expanding social security. Um, the majority of every way you cut up the demographics want to expand benefits, Republicans, independents, um, Democrats, any way you cut it. And, and um, way more people believe in the Loch Ness Monster in this country then want to cut social security benefits. Again, according to the polling, um, it's one of the most deeply unpopular uh, policies there is. So in any venue uh, that you have to support um, getting everybody uh, on board, every Democrat on board with uh, expanding social security and that we should have a unified uh, message on that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we should, keep pushing the Republicans on what is your plan? Um, the reason that they keep having to say, you know, or pretend that they're not going to cut Social Security is because uh, we keep asking them that question. And that is in any venue uh, that you have, uh, incredibly helpful. We have um, a um, uh, person on the Hill who's just asking Republican members if they would promise to never cut uh, social security benefits. And um, he's not gotten anyone to say that. None of them will, will pledge uh, no cuts, but he's gotten multiple of them to say, in fact, actually uh, social security cuts are on the table. Um, so highlighting that this um, bill, the Expand Social Security Act, the legislative uh, future of it is, is still a, a long time coming to build enough support to actually um, say pass it. Uh, you know, that's going to take years in different configurations of Congress, but the fight over uh, expanding Social Security versus cutting Social Security is extremely live right now uh, because of the Republicans uh, holding the debt ceiling hostage uh, in order to extract uh, cuts to uh, Social Security, to Medicare, to Medicaid. Um, and I think... Um, hey, Alex, I have a question while we're, we're waiting. Actually, great. we have two prepared questions, and it ties into what you were just saying about the future of the Social Security Expansion Act. And it seems like uh, Social Security... Uh, is really something that is popular, as you said, according to the Data for Progress think tank, an overwhelming majority of likely voters, 78% are in favor of the Expansion Act, 85% of Democrats, 75% of independents, and 72% of Republicans. 
At the same time, over 50 major organizations endorse it. But right now it has 25 co-sponsors in the House and nine in the Senate. So what we're wondering as Democrats abroad and as Democrats is what we can do to increase those numbers so that it doesn't take so long to get our policymakers in tune with popular opinion on this important issue. Um, that's a great question. And I think uh, basically whipping support for this bill, uh, which uh, we do, um, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you have a Democratic office that you can call that is not on the bill, um, they should be on the bill. As you said, the polling shows it's, um, you know, this is not um, in any way a fringe issue. This is central um, to the Democratic platform. Uh, President Biden ran on a social security expansion um, act, uh, platform when he ran for president. So um, we should definitely try to get more support on the bill uh, in the House and uh, the Senate. Uh, and I don't know, we have a variety of tools uh, that we could uh, share with you all to make sure that you're connecting with um, the right people, or you can just go to the um, uh, the switchboard. And with that, I can toss it back over to uh, the MC. Hi. I'm going to say just quickly that uh, Betsy gave an excellent introduction to the Congresswoman and uh, articulated well what great work she is doing for us in the House of Representatives right now. And with that, we would like to turn it over to the Congresswoman on a very busy day. Thank you very much for taking time out for us. No, of course. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I wish that, um, that I had more time with you. I was uh, really enjoying what I was able to hear there. But I appreciate the opportunity to join you in virtual community uh, this evening. I know a few of my close colleagues have had the opportunity to build with you around shared progressive policy goals. And so, again, I'm grateful for the invitation to this virtual table uh, and also for uh, uh, the very kind introduction. Are you all still there? Because I just lost you on my screen. <laughs> so can someone just say, you, you hear me? We hear you. We hear, hear, you. Hear, hear you. OK, excellent. Um, but first and foremost, I just want to say, um, you know, I really, in, in movement building partnerships, seek to usher in a politic of, of transformation uh, rather than transaction. And, um, you know, I'm just so appreciative of your recognizing that um, support is a verb, and I'm grateful for your investment uh, in our shared movement for justice and peace at home and abroad. And I'm very fortunate to have grown up uh, in a household with, um, I think a parent is a child's first teacher, and I had an extraordinary one uh, in both of my parents who taught me early on that the, the most effective, sustainable, transformative way to effectuate change is through movements. Uh, and uh, this is a movement, a progressive movement that understands that we are one human family, that our future and our, that our freedoms and our destinies are tied, and that it's critical that we be inclusive and uh, intersectional in the coalitions that we build that center the humanity and dignity of all people. You know, none of us live in big checked boxes. We live in complexity. We live in nuance. We live in intersectionality. And so that's the way that I seek to legislate. And that's the way that I seek to uh, movement build. I know I was speaking a moment ago about uh, my mother. May she rest in peace and power. My mother was a, a tenants' rights organizer, a, uh, a proud Democrat, a super voter, and um, was an extraordinary role model for me in terms of the power of civic engagement, uh, but also that um, sort of in the Stacey Abrams uh, school of thought that we don't elect saviors, we elect partners. And uh, a part of partnership is accountability. So my mother really modeled for me early on that uh, when it comes to the work of us as, um, as agitators, as activists, um, as, uh, as civic agents, uh, and our relationship with those in government and needed to be one that was cooperative uh, and, sim and symbiotic truly. 
And my mother also made sure I knew early on that it was a beautiful thing to be black and something that I should be proud of, but that I was being born into a struggle. And she had an expectation that I would do my part in that struggle and the work of liberation uh, for black people uh, and all marginalized people uh, and community. And so uh, that is the work that I, I continue to seek to do in deep partnership uh, with the communities that have been entrusted me with this awesome honor and responsibility is to uh, effectuate change through movement building. And so uh, I also, um, you know, this is also work that I take on because I represent a vibrant, diverse and dynamic district in the Massachusetts seven. And it is also one of the most unequal districts in the country and the most unequal in our congressional delegation where in a three mile radius from uh, Cambridge home to Harvard and MIT to Roxbury, uh, actually uh, Nubian Square is, is what it's recently been renamed. Uh, life expectancy drops by 30 years and median household income by $50,000. And so this is why I say that policy is my love language because every inequity, every disparity, every racial injustice is one that was codified in a budget, is one that was uh, codified uh, through, through lawmaking and usual, usually federal lawmaking. Uh, and so uh, what I seek to do today is to uh, legislate uh, in a way that legislates healing and equity and justice in the same way that policy violence uh, has inflicted great hurt and harm on uh, many communities for generations, legislating hurt and harm. So we already know what it is to live in the present and in the residual of, of policy violence, of legislated hurt and harm. And I, I think it's possible uh, to live in a present uh, and a future of legislated equity, healing, and justice. And so policy is my love language. Um, I know we are, are in the, um, the house is in the minority, um, but I still believe there are many iterations of power that are available to us. Uh, the power of the movement, the power of platform, the power of convening, the power of uh, letterhead uh, to, to conduct congressional oversight, and the power of the pen. And I'm still going to wield that because we don't only organize when we have the gavel or in an election cycle, and we don't only legislate uh, when we have the gavel or an election cycle. So last month, uh, my dear friend and I, Senator Cory Booker, we reintroduced our legislation, the American Opportunities Act. A shorthand of that is the baby bonds uh, bill. And this would create a federally funded uh, savings account, a seed account for every, every child um, who calls this country home in order to make economic opportunity a birthright um, for every child and to help close the racial wealth gap. And the racial wealth gap, again, is the result of generations of precise and intentional policy violence. So I think uh, we have to be just as precise, um, just as precise in uh, legislating equity and equality as uh, those were those forces at work were precise uh, in legislating the uh, marginalization and the oppression. And so we know wealth is primarily passed down from one generation to the next and generations of subsidizing the richest households have entrenched an extraordinary wealth gap, especially by race, uh, which is one of the reasons why the student debt uh, burden is disparate on black borrowers because uh, black Americans have been locked out of every major a federal relief program from the Homestead Act to the GI Bill targeted by redlining, denying our families ability to build generational wealth. So we borrow and default at higher rates. So all these things are interconnected. And so how I see the, uh, our American Opportunities Accounts Act or baby bonds is closing the racial wealth gap is at birth, every child would be given um, a seed account of $1,000. And then each year children will receive up to an additional $2,000 deposit into their American Opportunity Account, depending on family income. So it would, it would fluctuate. Um, and there are projections that um, by the time that child turns 18, that the money that has accrued over time, depending on where you fall in that socioeconomic status, could range from 18,000 to $24,000. And then our legislation calls for three permissible uses. Um, and that is uh, once you withdraw those funds at 18, uh, you can use them to purchase a home, to start a business, or to pursue higher education. Now, um, I do want to be honest about some of the limitations of our legislative power right now, given that we are governing uh, in the minority. Baby bonds is among 
critical pieces of legislation that have been bottlenecked and blocked uh, while we are in the minority in the House, but I wanna be clear, we soldier on uh, because there's nothing minor about the harm that wealth and inequality causes. And so we have to be that much more emboldened, that much more resolved in seeking to advance policy solutions that go as broad and as deep as the hurt is. Um, I don't want people to know the work of Democrats because we've put out artfully crafted press releases. I want people to know the work of Democrats uh, and that we are uh, pro-woman and worker and immigrant and LGBTQ and pro-democracy uh, and pro-racial justice and green justice and gender and economic because they can feel the impact of these transformative policies in their lives every day. Not because we're press relief, because they can feel it. So I'm gonna to continue to you know, work to effectively steward every aspect of power, of our shared power to make progress for all of our communities. And as I said, the power of the pen uh, as a lawmaker to craft legislation to close the wealth gap, to protect abortion access and reproductive freedom, to transform our criminal legal system, to treat long COVID. I'm gonna use the power of the platform, bringing a bold and unapologetic perspective to every decision-making table and shining a light on issues that have been overlooked or ignored for too long. Using the power platform to build diverse coalitions to successfully cancel student debt, put us on a pathway to wealth equity. And I also bring the same framework of justice and I think this is really important. Um, if we really do believe, we seek to affirm that black lives matter, to codify the value of every black or marginalized life in a budget or in a policy, then, then there can be, um, there can be no boundaries to that. And so I proudly co-chair the Congressional, uh, the House Haiti Caucus. We resurrected this about uh, almost four years ago and I represent the third largest Haitian diaspora in the country. And so if we really believe that black lives matter, uh, then, then Haitian uh, lives matter. Um, then uh, the black lives throughout the diaspora uh, matter. And uh, we know that our immigration policies are unjust but oftentimes that narrative is dominated by our siblings in Central America or our siblings uh, from representing brown communities. Um, but those policies are just unjust period. And they do have a disparate impact on black migrants um, as well. And so I'm very proud to co-chair uh, the House Haiti Caucus um, and uh, to speak out stridently about the unjust treatment of Haiti uh, and the Haitian diaspora and to, to uh, affirm the rights of Haitian residents to be afforded dignity and respect. I also vice chair um, the task force on aging and families, uh, working to protect and expand the programs we promised to American seniors, uh, including Medicaid, Social Security, um, fighting for housing for LGBT elders, uh, older Americans Bill of Rights. Um, student debt is also uh, an issue affecting our seniors. Believe it or not, I have 76 year olds in my district on fixed incomes who've had their benefits garnished because they still owe uh, student loans. Um, so those are just some of the examples that I would lift up. Um, and so I know they're, gonna, they're, they're calling me out of here and this is so uh, unenviable uh, that I'm coming in late and I have to, to leave early and I can't even look at you all. <laughs> so I hope that this, is, this has been okay, but uh, I'll just close out here and just say that all of these issues, foreign and domestic are really intersectional and the frame of equity and justice and humanity is universal. And I believe it's incumbent on all of us to continue fighting for justice for all of our communities. And so I thank you for your partnership. I thank you for being um, civil engineers and social architects and activists and disruptors and community and movement builders. And I'm so honored to do this work alongside you. Are you guys there? <laughs> Betsy, are you, you need to unmute, I think. Oh, right, sorry. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Do you have time for questions or do yes, you have- Yes, I do. Oh, great. So we have some questions for you. Bruce, would you like to ask the first question? I'm going to uh, pass given the short time we have and uh, ask our representative from the Global Youth Caucus to ask that question. Okay, sure. Justin. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Congresswoman Presley. Um, anyways, my question is, um, given the polarization we experience um, in discussions on a wide range of issues, what advice do you have for us um, as we promote baby bonds when talking to friends and family who may be skeptical? That's it. 
Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, I mean, this is true for uh, wealth inequality and certainly should be true for so many issues. I mean, these are not, um, doesn't matter, you know, uh, domestic, foreign, um, red, blue, urban, rural, suburban, um, we should all want better for the next generation. Um, you know, it bothers me so much, like I've been a, a lead negotiator to the White House in getting the president to take executive action on student debt cancellation. And so many people would say, you know, well, I, I paid my loans. Well, I did too. Um, but, you know, the next generation is supposed to do better. We're supposed to alleviate hardship and make that road easier. Um, and, you know, I think uh, this is one, do, one way that we can undo uh, centuries of harm and really chart a path uh, towards um, greater uh, wealth, uh, equitable wealth, you know. Um, and I also just, you know, look, it wasn't that long ago that people said we were in the midst of a racial reckoning. Uh, I'm still waiting on that. I don't, I don't know that we've been in a reckoning. I think it's been a bit of an awakening. But as someone uh, who grew up in the Baptist church, a reckoning is something of epic proportions, and we have yet to see that. Um, and, and we won't uh, until um, every life, um, and, and the humanity and dignity of all people are centered in our in our budget center, our policy making. So, you know, I would say in the polarization, you know, it, make an appeal for our babies, our babies in a future, you know, and, and the best chance for them. These are transcendent universal issues. Right. We have a question from our reparations task force. I'm going to ask Daniel Stein to read it for you. Oh, I'm Please. sorry. One other thing. I'm sorry that I missed this. When you said who are skeptical about government programs, people are selectively skeptical about government programs because they're not skeptical about Social Security. <laughs> they're, they're not. They weren't skeptical about, you know, uh, all the federal funds that weren't used during the, the pandemic to make sure that um, more small businesses uh, survived and were, and were thriving. Um, and so people tend to have, it seems, um, uh, selective skepticism about government programs, depending on um, their own lived experience. Thank you very much. Daniel. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you again, uh, Representative Presley, for being here. Uh, we have a question from our reparations task force. And that is oh, yes. in reference to both what you said about the um, baby bonds bill, as well as the racial yet to be reckoning um, that we are hoping for and struggling for. Mm -hmm. we, want to, we want to highlight the uh, fact that both you and Senator Booker are champions of the of HR 40 and S40, the Federal Reparation Study Commission bill, uh, for which we are very appreciative. And during the president, the 2020 presidential election, we saw many different conceptions of what reparations could be. Almost all of them were social equity programs masquerading as reparations. The confusion between social equity for Black Americans and reparations for accumulated damage of anti-Black policy needs to be made clear going forward. And we're wondering if you can clarify for the audience the distinction between social equity and reparations. And can you talk about why a robust reparations committee hmm. or committee? OK, well, I hope I understand. I hope I understand this correctly. Okay, so uh, as an example, um, there are some economists that I've met with as we're advocating for baby bonds who have said, oh, this is like a form of reparations. Or when I've advocated for student debt cancellation and spoke about the disparate impact on black borrowers because black Americans' families uh, were denied aspect uh, access to federal relief programs, they say, oh, this is like a form of, of, of reparations. Um, or legislation, to uh, grant uh, restitution to uh, World War II African-American, um, the descendants uh, the, of those veterans, um, because those black veterans were denied access to the GI Bill. Um, they said, oh, this is a form of reparations. And so, um, you know, I, I do think it's true that um, precise legislation like this, some that I've introduced and I'm championing and others that I support, um, do seek to undo centuries of harm. But, um, what I find uh, that folks are looking for is a greater sense of urgency and commitment really for just direct cash. Uh, we've been able to do this with um, 
uh, Japanese uh, Americans when it comes to internment camps and things like that. You know, so there's we are grateful to Representative Sheila Jackson Lee for her leadership on HR 40, which I support. Um, that is a study for what reparations um, would look like. Um, and and as I understand it, um, you know, there's people are appreciative of some of the efforts that I just amplified in this uh, in our virtual meeting here, but they just want us to get to that that direct cash uh, for. Um, the economic injustices, the brutality and the harms that have been caused uh, to African-Americans. And, you know, I've been having some of those conversations um, with uh, the mayors in my district um, and, and leaders throughout the country, as you saw people doing things with ARPA funds like universal basic income uh, and having that being uh, targeted to the communities, uh, you know, most in need. So, you know, there are a lot of things that we saw possible during the pandemic that we've been told for a long time were impossible, but we found a way to do those things, including, um, you know, direct cash. So I don't know if that answers, answers the question, but I would just say that, you know, I support reparations. I support, um, you know, direct cash. Um, I wish it was as simple as just cut the check, but this is why we do have to go through a legislative process. And I thank uh, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee because, um, that movement has continued to grow. And there have been, um, I think this last go around more co-sponsors for HR 40 uh, than we've ever had um, before. But again, even when we're able to move things out the house, these things are bottlenecked because we do need to abolish the filibuster. Um, and so if we're able to, to even get the, the votes that we need to move bills out of the house, they're still bottlenecked and, and, and languishing. Does that answer the question? Please tell me if it doesn't. <laughs> I've never been, I've never had the question posed to me in that way. So. I think we've got a good set of answers. If you have any ideas on what might be necessary in addition to social and economic equity measures like baby bonds, things that go beyond that, that would establish a robust commitment to reparation. Okay. Can you do one last question for us, Congresswoman? Sure. Right. Bruce, over to you. Congresswoman, I'd Some like- Cannabis justice too. I just want to add that, you know, that's also I see that, you know, just given the the policy violence of the war, um, the war on drugs. And so that fight continues in terms of uh, making sure those whose lives have been uh, irreparably uh, harmed uh, because of uh, cannabis uh, convictions that um, that those things are expunged. Um, and that uh, in the industry that we continue to fight for those vertical and horizontal opportunities, you know, not just in uh, workforce and in ownership, but in, in every aspect of the industry. So that's an ongoing fight federally. Okay, I'm sorry, last question. Yes, uh, this is uh, Bruce Murray, the chair of our Progressive Caucus, letting you know that if you could see us, you would see a lot of nodding heads. We are in full <laughs> agreement with what you're saying and so happy that you're willing to answer our questions. While we strive to strengthen the prospects for baby bonds at the federal level, Washington DC has initiated its program In Washington state seems ready to follow. Lawmakers from coast to coast are monitoring the DC experiment and contemplating their own. What do you think the prospects are for legislation at the state and local levels? And what can we do to help push for their passage? Oh, Bruce, I love this question. And um, this actually uh, segues nicely with our conversation we just had on reparations because I'm also monitoring those municipalities that are doing uh, really progressive things like San Diego. There are municipalities that are already passing measures when it comes to reparations and just doing direct cash. So trying to keep track of, of those things as they're moving throughout the country where we don't have federal action, but you see people are standing in the gap in uh, state houses and in city halls. And, uh, and the same is true for baby bonds. I was remiss to say that earlier. Uh, this is getting a lot of momentum. And in fact, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, our treasurer, Deb Goldberg, is piloting um, a baby bonds program. And so we're waiting to, to get uh, more data points when that's up and running and how that goes. Um, so I do think there are great opportunities. Um, unfortunately, the best, um, uh, what is the, the best persuasion argument is to be able to point to um, models that have been implemented and are successful and you already have that data, um, but we're still you know, early in a lot of those processes. So um, 
I think for many where we are proposing this, it's sort of do your own analog. There isn't, you know, this stabilizing reference point of, of data of here's someone who, this is a state who's already done on this and this is how well it's done and what the impact was. You know, like I already have some of that data on universal basic income programs, but I don't currently have that uh, when it comes to uh, baby bonds. But I know that, you know, more states are, are piloting programs, including the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I think our, our chances are, are, um, are good there because while we're still dealing with um, the challenges in the political landscape here in Washington of passing federal legislation um, as Democrats, um, where we do have partners like I do in Massachusetts with um, uh, the Healy Driscoll administration or with, with mayors, we have to ask them to stand in the gap. You know, for the next two years, I'll just be doing the work here in Washington of really harm mitigation uh, while, while trying to, to be at a dual track of also advancing the progress that all of us want to see made possible. So Bruce, I love that question. Um, and I hope that we can follow up more uh, offline uh, to get a better um, uh, inventory, sort of do our own audit of, of what states are already uh, online with this and how we can get access to um, any data points there. Those also help us in making our arguments to other people like, see, this isn't that scary. It is possible, um, it can be done. Um, and especially now, because there's uh, still a number of states, including Massachusetts, who have not spent down their ARPA funds. Um, you know, so there's a, still the opportunity to be able to do some, some innovative piloting. Well, uh, we definitely want to stay in touch and talking about examples. There are many European countries where many of us reside that uh, have similar programs. For example, in Austria, where I am from, we'd like to provide more information about programs like that. And we also want to say that uh, when we started our meeting, we talked about Democrats abroad state teams. There isn't one in Massachusetts now, but talking oh. with you, we're seeing that uh, there is a great deal of interest in starting a Massachusetts state team. And we would like to stay in touch with you about that as it ramps up. Oh, please do. And as, as much as it's a great honor to do the work that I do here every day, I'm a little envious that you all are where you are, <laughs> especially since you're pace setters in so many ways. Uh, since you're in Austria, I'll, I'll share with the group that I do also co-chair the Congressional Bike Caucus. <laughs> so, you know, very passionate about multimodal uh, infrastructure. Uh, so that's a conversation for, uh, for another day. Um, I do also chair the Abortion Rights and Access Task Force. So anything having to do with litigation, legislation, or mobilization when it comes to bodily autonomy and reproductive rights and abortion care. Uh, I'm also your, your, um, your, your warrior on the front line there. So, so many things that we could continue to talk about, but I thank you for prioritizing this discussion around uh, wealth and equality. I thank you for inviting me to this virtual table and um, I can't wait until the next time we can convene virtually or uh, perhaps even in person. Excellent, we're all coming to Washington DC for our annual general meeting in June, by the way. Oh, and okay. If, uh, well, my, my scheduler is here listening and so she'll, she'll make a mental note about that and I, and I do hope you'll follow up. Thank you, thank you so much for being with us today. Of course, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank all right, you take good care. Thanks for all that you all do. I appreciate you immensely. Oh, Thanks for representing thank there, even, even hey, those hey. Massachusetts voters. Oh my goodness. Listen, before I go, can I leave you all with a gift because I'm an Aquarius and I love affirmations. And this is an affirmation that's been carrying me through these times. And it is that I choose the discipline of hope over the ease of cynicism. And I choose fortitude over fatalism. Take good care. Wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I, I needed to hear that today. Okay, <laughs> see? I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. All right, Betsy, we're going to hand it back to you. And All right. if Alex Lawson is still here, I think you have a question queued up for him. I do indeed. Alex, are you here? I yes. am, I wouldn't miss that. Um, oh, that great. Was, that was brilliant. Uh, <laughs> I get to speak after Congresswoman Presley. That's a, a great honor. Right. Okay, so this is from the uh, Global Senior Caucus. And 
it's kind of a little bit of a long question, but I'll, I'll read it. The, the windfall elimination provision or WEP is a statutory- oh, good. I was just starting to type that in the um, in there. Um, okay. If, it's a statute. You, can I, yeah, go on. If, if you think it's important to get out uh, everything about WEP GPO um, on what it is for everybody who's watching, uh, feel free. But I also, we can go right into okay. the status of WEP GPO if uh, you would rather do that. Okay, well, we just want to know if you support the elimination of WEP through HR 82, the Social Security Fairness Act. So we support the elimination of WEP GPO just uh, uh, across the board. Um, this is a completely and, and totally unfair, unjust um, policy. I mean, it was part of an attack by Ronald Reagan on public employees. I mean, all of the things. Um, so we will continue to uh, support uh, eliminating WEP GPO. Uh, I then also personally and uh, it, it organizationally, we think that the most likely uh, vehicle is not going to be an individual. We should work uh, to push on individual bills on WEP GPO, but probably it would be ensuring that in any vehicle um, that addresses uh, expanding social security benefits, that eliminating WEP GPO is actually a central portion of that. Um, we're still in sort of the place where the social security uh, legislation that would have the votes to move um, is uh, not not there yet. Uh, so anyways, that's a long way of saying web GPO is really important to keep centrally in um, the discussion on uh, social security. Um, it also just, it, it has the most fiery activists because it is, you know, like I don't wanna get into grading fairness stuff, but like what's worse, right? Um, like two year waiting on disability, right? That's set up to, so people die. Um, we want to get rid of that too. Um, but web GPO is so viscerally unfair um, that uh, the activist energy around it is also something that um, politically people would be, politicians would be just, um, it, they'd be silly not to see that um, the, the the fire around web GPO can actually push forward um, all of our fights on social security. Um, so that was a longer answer. I see it as its own fight and then also integral to the bigger fight, uh, which is basically Republicans want to cut social security uh, and Democrats want to expand social security. Thank you so much. It's really good to hear your answer. We also I also have, was trying to yeah. answer some in the chat. I was just doing the web GPO oh, one, right. but um, Great. I did I did put a video of uh, where so there's some Pentagon spending stuff like uh, we're we're in on that fight every year. I mean, like as as much you know uh, uh, the the ridiculousness of the conversation in Washington D.C. is just like if you if you work in it, it just slaps you in the face all the time because you know we're we want to add vision, hearing, dental, for example, to Medicare, right? Like, obviously you have ears, eyes, and teeth. Um, and it's like, well, we don't have money to pay for that, uh, 80 billion. Uh, like, oh, well, no, we don't have money. And then every year, like clockwork, right? $7 trillion, 700 billion, just like clockwork. Um, and they never have arguments. Not only do they not have arguments about like, oh, we can't afford that. They fight for putting more in than is requested every year. Um, and it's just like, who can burn more money in the Pentagon budget? Um, so yes, we think that that is um, a, a critical fight. And you know what the Congresswoman was saying was so um, powerful and right. And she's so brilliant uh, and such a, a warrior for um, this work in this struggle. And something that she pointed out that I think is important is all of the stuff we're talking about is uh, the disparities and inequities um, that we're talking about, systemic racism, systemic sexism, um, uh, anti-LGBT discrimination, all of that affects people's wages in their working lives and then follows uh, people into retirement through lower social security benefits. Um, you can see it. I mean, it's, and so um, although when we push for expanding Social Security, we say everybody's benefits are going to go up 
uh, $200 a month. We also do have targeted ones, uh, improvements as well. But this disproportionately helps um, communities of color because communities of color are, are disproportionately harmed uh, by the structural racism that comes with um, lower wages. Um, ex and I, I feel like this crowd understands all of that. But it is important um, to state, especially when I got sort of the uh, uh, introduction by the way the Congresswoman was speaking about issues, the magnitude of social security, I don't think many people can really, unless you're like a nerdy wonk like me who reads about it all the time, um, it's so big that when you make changes in social security, it actually has societal impacts that are massive. Um, it's an engine against wealth inequality. If you increase uh, benefits and at the same time make the funding mechanism progressive. So right now it's regressive. You only pay in on the first $160,000 of income that you pay. So the richer you are, the less you pay into social security. If we make the funding mechanism of social security progressive as well, uh, let me uh, finish the this part of it so you get it. The benefit structures are so progressive that they overcome a deeply regressive revenue structure uh, by replacing more income for those who make less during their working lives. And because of that, the net result is that social security is, uh, if there's maybe the EITC, but if not the most redistributive, then uh, one of the most redistributive, meaning it is fighting against wealth inequality. Um, and the magnitude of that is there's not many other things, if there is no other thing, uh, where, you know, uh, social uh, changes to social security uh, can reverberate and help. Um, they'll never, you can't like fix broken things, right? Like we need to raise the minimum wage. We need to eliminate uh, the gender wage disparity in um people's working lives. We need campaigns to make all that happen. But what we can do with social security policy is ameliorate some of the stuff. Um, and it does it in an incredibly uh, u profound, universal, but targeted way. It's, uh, right. it's really, and I just showed you how much of a nerd I am on the policy. It's like, it's <laughs> like a beautiful policy, right? So if you can get back to what Frances Perkins, who actually created this idea, what she was trying to accomplish with social security. And if you go back to that time, um, uh, the, the wealth and income inequality was very similar to what we see today. And what they did was created a few things. They established the minimum wage, uh, they created social security, and they created the right to collectively bargain and form a union. And so now as we find ourselves facing the same inequality, the same evil and villain in this story, we need to look at raising the minimum wage, expanding social security, increasing laws that uh, protect uh, workers' right to collectively bargain. Um, and the Social Security Expansion Act definitely um, does that on the social security front. So I, I took a long answer there, but uh, it was a fun one to, to, to share with you all. Thank you very much. Could, could you answer two more questions for us, do you think? Yep. Yeah, Anton, great. Bruce and then Daniel. Actually, take it away, Daniel. Sure thing. Um, so in, out of, I guess out of uh, somewhat respect to your, uh, as you say, nerdy wonkiness, um, we have a question that says, when bills or laws refer to increased tax payments for those making 250,000 or 400,000 per year, isn't the threshold actually more than those amounts since these are AGI or adjusted gross income amounts and maybe much higher than those threshold amounts? And if so, uh, should we not be including this in the messaging to the public? Mm, I have to look into that. Um, I don't I don't actually think so. I think um, I think what I think the the 250 is the actual 
it's above 250 itself. Um, but I'd have to look into the specific. I think I, I cut and paste it um, over. So it's the same question that's in the, the Q&A, right? Yeah. Let me let me get back to you on that one. OK, thanks. Because it's specifically on the tax uh, pay. Uh, let me just get back to you on that one. Sure thing. Thank you. Daniel, do you have another Q&A question? Um, no, go ahead. I think yours is, uh, you're, you're up next. Go ahead, Bruce. Actually, I want to uh, take this opportunity too for Alex uh, being so flexible and also for his ongoing work as executive director at Social Security Works. I want to encourage everyone to go over to uh, the Social Security Works site and uh, where you can sign up for their newsletter and messages. And Alex is sending out uh, news almost on a daily basis. And I'm wondering if there's one last thing that you would like to share from that front burner on what's, what's going on right now. Yeah, um, I think really the exposing the Republicans for um, exactly what they're doing with the debt ceiling, right? This is what they did 10 years ago. The media uh, still don't write it up simply enough that they're holding the debt ceiling hostage to demand cuts to Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Um, the Democrats are holding firm in saying, you know, clean debt ceiling. But this is the specific setup that is most dangerous um, to these programs because what they're holding hostage with the debt ceiling is global financial collapse. Um, and so it is the the issue right now. And and there is not, no one is reporting uh, a discussion. Uh, of like, you know, oh, this is the plan to get past the debt ceiling. Um, there still is no plan. McCarthy and the House, it's a negotiation between the House Republicans and the White House. Um, and McCarthy is still saying, you know, I'm not going to tell you what cuts, but uh, for example, you have to like say you're going to reverse uh, the student debt um uh, executive action. So they're made, they're, right, they're making demands, but they're still not putting forward their plans of cuts. And the White House is demanding uh, to see their proposal. What are the cuts that you actually want to make? Um, anything that you can do to raise the profile of uh, the stakes here. So the White House is playing this correctly. They're playing this as strongly and boldly as um, I could have uh, hoped for. Having gone through this in the Obama era of austerity when, um, right, I mean, like what happened there was they they impaneled um, the Bull Simpson Commission or the BS Commission, as I coined it, um, and they put forward their BS proposals to cut our Social Security uh, and Medicare. And uh, we had to uh, defeat each one of these proposals one by one. Um, the, you know, that happened on the debt ceiling. So that's the level of threat uh, that we have right now. And a commission is still um, a very uh, real danger. I will also say the Biden White House did this amazing announcement. One of the um, most dangerous commissions is carried by Senator Romney. It's called the Trust Act. And the, oh, the uh, Biden White House called it a death panel. Um, they were like, it's a social security death panel. So I thought that was like incredibly powerful. And I don't think that that specific bill is coming back from it. But um, the problem is at this moment, um, the like exact right thing to do is not support this exact bill to get right. Like whipping support for the expansion bills is always great. Um, but the fight, um, I think Representative Presley said um, harm mitigation uh, is something that that uh, we have to do in this setup because the Republicans are uh, in control of the House. That is a very real um, and present danger to Social Security. Uh, and one of the few setups that you can get anything about Social Security done without 60 senators um, in the Senate uh, in 
I won't go through a process thing, but that's why it's so dangerous. And what the Republicans do is they want um, some sort of bipartisan so they can pin it all on uh, the Democrats. Any avenue that you have to raise the profile of this story to demand um, that all of our Democrat um, elected officials um, stay strong and not negotiate uh, with people who take the world economy hostage. Uh, that's the number one fight of the moment. Alex, thank you very, very much for those comments and for that advice. We will take it wholeheartedly. And uh, I also want to thank our global chair who has been very patient uh, in sticking with us after overcoming some audio difficulties. She would like to sign in now with some comments. Uh, Candace, the floor is yours. Uh, hello everyone. And uh, thank you, Bruce, for just uh, passing over to me. Apologies, I had some uh, audio issues earlier. I don't know what's going on with my Zoom, but I'm grateful uh, to be here with you. And I'm glad that those were all resolved by the time that our two speakers came on. Uh, definitely want to thank you, Alex, as well as the Congresswoman uh, for what were truly some riveting remarks. And uh, I just want to leave you with a few thoughts. I'm, I'm glad that I was able, uh, in hindsight, actually, to, to speak at the end of this event after hearing that. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's really put things in perspective again and is a good reminder of what we're fighting for. Um, I feel very inspired <laughs> leaving this call. And I hope that you do as well. Um, and it reminds me again of truly what we are fighting for and what is possible when we do get the right people into office. Um, some of you have heard me speak recently at some AGMs or other DA events. And uh, one point that is really resonating with me right now is you don't just win elections for the sake of winning elections. I think that you know as we approach a lot of our get out the work vote, we're focused on getting out the vote, which is great, right? That is that is a part of our role. Our main role as Democrats abroad is to mobilize that overseas vote. Um, and if you haven't requested your ballot this year, votefromabroad.org. Uh, and January 1st of next year, votefromabroad.org. But it's really what comes beyond that. And hearing today's discussion and hearing about the great initiatives uh, that people like Congresswoman Presley are fighting for, since we did get her into office is very energizing. And it puts it in perspective, you know, just because you're not in the majority now doesn't mean that you shouldn't be uh, initi initiating certain measures. But the reality is it's a heck of a lot easier <laughs> when you are in the majority. So we do have our work cut out for us in 2024. We know that we have our work cut out for us this year with governorships up for grabs, state legislatures up for grabs, attorney general races up for grabs. If you're a Wisconsin voter, you better know and be voting in that Supreme Court race on April 4th. But it's not about winning, right? It's about what comes after that. It's about putting progressive policies into action. It's about making a difference uh, when it comes to things like addressing income inequality, which we all know uh, is one of, if not the most, urgent issues in the United States right now and has been for some time. Just, to, I saw a great question in the chat too um, from one of our, our members residing in Europe about what can we do, right? How can we show people that these policies are working elsewhere in the world? And that really invites, I mean, <laughs> that is the perfect invitation uh, for me to say, please get involved with Democrats abroad. As Americans who are living overseas, we have seen, we have lived, we have experienced different systems. Of course, we have our attachment to the United States, whatever that may be. Maybe you grew up there. Maybe you became a naturalized citizen. Maybe you have an American parent. Whatever your unique relationship is to the United States and whatever your unique relationship is to the country where you are living now, those experiences matter. And it's important that we transfer them back and inform the political process in the United States. Not everyone, and it's certainly not to take for granted, but a lot of you tuning in right now are living in societies where you don't have to worry about what happens if you fall and you break an arm. 
you don't have to worry about if I wanted to go get an education, would I need to take out hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans? You have access to affordable transportation, clean, green transportation. And so we need to show up as a constituency. We need to get involved. That is the beautiful thing about Democrats abroad is we can bring those experiences together and we can transport them back and inform the US political process. Having said that, I really, really hope uh, that you will join more of these monthly Monday meetings that our Progressive Caucus so beautifully organizes. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce and Sue and everyone else who is involved uh, in setting these up so that this conversation can continue. And please join us as we move forward to 2024 uh, by continuing to attend these events, by voting, and you know, <laughs> I do have to get a donation ask in there. The nuts and bolts of this organization, uh, we, are, we rely on the generosity of our supporters uh, and we do see the power of that. And uh, especially again, our, our progressive caucus initiatives, uh, if you can chip in five or 10 bucks right now, if every person on this call chips in 10 bucks, that is more voters that we are gonna mobilize. And again, that is more good progressive politicians that we are gonna get elected. That is more good progressive policies that we are gonna see. So it really does come all together and it starts with you on this call, with your engagement, with your support. And I am so excited uh, to be here with you and to be with you as we move forward. So thank you everyone. Candace, thank you very, very much. And we are especially grateful that uh, we have such a great network of caucuses two of them, the Global Youth Caucus and Global Seniors Caucus, co-hosting this event today. And Betsy Etore, uh, you're next with uh, your closing statement. Okay, thanks very much and thanks Candice. Okay. So on the 14th of December, 2020, the United Nations General Assembly declared 2021 to 2030, the decade of healthy aging, recognizing that the pandemic has highlighted existing gaps in policies, systems, and services, and urging action to combat the toxic effects of ageism. This spectacular growth of the elderly population demands special attention by policy and decision makers. It is obvious that from a cultural perspective, the social impact of aging is a complex issue. The wide range of possible future programs will be the result of differences and similarities in social values, relationships, and dynamics within each society. The modern industrial societies live in a culture that emphasizes competition for economic wealth, that values economic over social productivity and that accepts inequities based on class, gender, and race, and furthermore recognizes that all these issues influence the parameters of aging populations. Women's specific issues are extremely important in considering social policies for elderly populations. Feminization of poverty and ill health during old age is a result of exacerbated risks for women across the life course. Appropriate care and support for this vulnerable group is a priority and will help to alleviate the toxic effects of aging. Please come and work with us on the Global uh, Seniors Caucus. We're an active group with monthly social chats with members of the Global Disability Caucus. Come this Friday, we have our, our global chat with the Disability Caucus. Also, very importantly, this coming Saturday, April 1st, we welcome Nancy Altman from Social Security Works to discuss WEP and Americans Abroad, How to Stop It Hurting Retirement Plans. Please attend this interesting event. event. Thanks very much for your attention. Back to you, Bruce. Betsy, thank you very much. Our Seniors Caucus is extremely active and that's the way we like it. 
We're also very pleased that our Global Youth Caucus is so active and its representative, Justin Hart, also would like to make a brief closing statement. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. It's great to be here on behalf of the Youth Caucus, as you mentioned. But uh, anyways, good afternoon, uh, everyone, or should I say good morning, afternoon and night. <laughs> this is Democrats Abroad, sort of the nature of the organization. Um, like you said, uh, my name is Justin. I'm a, a member of Democrats Abroad, Czech Republic. I am part of the uh, uh, steering committee um, of the Youth Caucus. But uh, anyways, this is my remark on, on, on behalf of the caucus. Um, I want to talk about a problem that affects not just our generation, but also generations that came before us. Um, it's a problem that we can't ignore, and that is, of course, wealth inequality. Um, as members of Gen Z, we are inheriting a world that remains vastly unequal. The richest 1% of people own more wealth than the bottom 50% combined. This gap is not just a problem for those struggling to get by. It's a problem for us all. When wealth is concentrated in the hands of the few, it creates a society that is divided and unstable. It's not just about the hoarding of wealth. It's about the power that comes with it, too. When a small group of people have unchecked power, they can use it to influence politics, media, and education, which leads to a society that is less democratic and less fair. The wealth gap also has real-world consequences. It means that the few have access to better education, healthcare, and job opportunities than the rest. It means that some people can afford to buy a house while others struggle to pay their skyrocketing rent. It means that some people can retire comfortably while others have to work well into their old age. And as members of Gen Z, we have a unique opportunity to address this problem. We're the most diverse and connected generation in US history. We have access to information and resources that previous generations could only dream of. And we can and should use our collective voice to demand change and hold those in power accountable. One way we can do this is by supporting policies that promote greater economic uh, equality, including things like raising the minimum wage, implementing pro uh, progressive tax policies, and providing universal health care, education, and of course, baby bonds. <laughs> we can also support organizations that are working to address wealth inequality, such as unions and advocacy groups, in addition to electing members of Congress uh, and expanding the squad. But we can't stop there. We also have to examine our, our own actions and beliefs. We need to ask ourselves, am I contributing to the problem of wealth inequality or am I part of the solution? We need to recognize the privilege that many of us have and use it to help those who are less fortunate. We need to be willing to have difficult conversations about race, class, and privilege and be open to learning from others. And that's it. Um, I'll wrap up by once again thanking our speakers, Congresswoman Presley and Director Lawson, uh, for their time. Um, and would also like to refer uh, any uh, under 26s here uh, who might be interested uh, in going to the Youth Caucus uh, to head over to the Democrats Abroad website uh, and check us out. It would be great to have you um, uh, on, on, on some of our events and calls. Um, so please get involved with the Youth Caucus. It would be uh, great to, great to uh, meet some fresh faces um, online at some point. But uh, all right, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Wow, ProDA is feeling those positive vibes right now from our seniors caucus and youth caucus. We're glad to be on your team. I want to uh, just take a minute here to say we've heard how progressive Democrats and our allies promote common sense solutions to tackle the wealth gap from cradle to rocking chair. And we know what we can do to make them reality. Thanks to our excellent speakers and all who have worked behind the scenes to ensure our event's success. Now it's time to get to work. We need more progressives elected up and down the ballot to achieve transformational change for everyone in America. Democrats Abroad is preparing to ensure we are resourced to work around the clock on issue awareness in critical elections this year and next. Your donation provides tools our volunteers need to reach Americans around the globe and help them engage with each other on key issues and voting. If you can help us with your modest donation today, we'll use it to advance baby bonds, social security expansion, and more transformational change for all of us. Thank you. And now it's over to our Vice Chair Sue Alxness with ProDA announcements. Hey there, thanks Bruce. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for your inspiring uh, words that really touched me. And uh, thank you, Betsy, also for speaking on behalf of the Seniors Caucus. Um, the Progressive Caucus uh, has our monthly 
uh, monthly Mondays for your progressive minds, which uh, is led by um, Betsy and Daniel. And the next one will be the last Monday in April with a climate focus. And we have uh, we have some really exciting speakers planned for that. So um, if you want to uh, know about that, you can check our events page or sign up for our um, for our newsletter uh, by becoming a member of the Progressive Caucus. And uh, someone will pop into the chat uh, that link. And um, we also have our monthly members meetings, and the next one will be this Saturday, um, April 1st, where we uh, talk about um, lots of activities underway within the, within the caucus and uh, our current focus on um, combating climate change, getting ready for the annual general meeting of Democrats abroad, um, planning our uh, upcoming monthly, monthly Mondays sessions, and uh, much, much more. Um, anyone who's interested in running for a leadership role within Democrats Abroad, um, some elections have happened, but s some are still coming up. Um, we'd love to have you join us on um, Saturday, uh, April 1st, to hear about, uh, to stick around after the meeting to talk about what it is, what, what it's like to run for election and that kind of thing. We also have um, that link uh, to our email can, and to that meeting can go in the chat. And DA is currently doing the presidential um, election delegate selection plan within Democrats Abroad. And there's a um, opportunity for all members to comment on that process, attend town hall meetings, uh, discussion, discussing the plan for how we'll conduct our global presidential primary and select delegates to go to the national convention in 2024. And that's going to um, that's underway right now. I think the deadline might be April 4th to put in uh your uh your response as part of the public comment period and uh there's a link to that um, going in the chat as well and of course uh we mentioned uh we put in a plug for with uh, the congresswoman that we'd love to see her uh in washington dc during our june uh annual meeting and of course we'd love to have a repeat uh appearance with alex in time to visit uh with him and others from social security works as well so um the details for that are available uh, on the uh, annual meeting website. And we're also um, always looking for folks to provide updates on uh, issues that we're following in social media. So we invite you to uh, consider whether there's something you might want to help us uh, get the word out about. There might be some youth caucus members that want to share some issues. We lost our student loan, our student debt person. We had someone doing regular student debt uh, posts once a week, um, but uh, she had to move on to other things. So um, that's it. That's available. <laughs> um, and I think that's it from the Progressive Caucus. Just, you know, follow us on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook. And we have a couple of announcements um, from uh, Angela Fobbs and then uh, Liz Blackburn. Angela, are you ready to go and share your important information with us? Uh, yes, I am ready. Hold on. Uh, I just wanted to ask everyone to please sign our Environmental Council National Climate Emergency Petition. It's very important. If you have seen the latest uh, IPCC report has come out and the meter is running. We don't have a lot of time left to take, you know, substantive action. So please sign the petition. Uh, we're going to be uh, combining our petition after we get it all signed with the actual DNC, ECCC petition to try to move President Biden to declare climate change a national emergency. And it's really important. I put the, the link in the chat and I would appreciate it if you would sign it and share it with your friends. Thank you. Um, I believe Liz Blackburn, where are you Liz? Um, I'm going to put you, I'm going to allow you to put you up here. Are you there, Liz? You want to go ahead and talk about Wisconsin? You can unmute. I see, I see Liz uh, is, should be able to unmute now. Hi, everyone. Thanks hey, for having me. So Democrats abroad, you've heard all that's at stake and you know the only way to see progressives in office is to do the work. So roll up your sleeves, it's time to get up and break the ice to get out the vote for Wisconsin. All Wisconsinites at home and abroad are currently voting to fill a vitally important state Supreme Court seat. 
And in 2019 Supreme Court election, our candidate lost by fewer than 6,000 votes. We need people voting from abroad and we need people voting back home. And this happened after a flood of GOP dark money hit the streets of Wisconsin, hit our airwaves. It's happening again. And mega backed opponent Dan Kelly has already said he's expecting far right billionaires, and they are, to shell out millions more to boost his campaign. Wisconsin, we are Wisconsin, we are Team Janet. Encourage every voter you know to vote for Judge Janet Protasewicz. The Supreme Court election is liberal candidate. And uh, that first name you've heard, uh, that last name is pronounced Protasewicz, Janet Protasewicz. But what's at stake? anti-abortion laws, gerrymandered maps, GOPs attacking working families, and environmental protections. All of these issues are on the ballot, including banned books. So we need you help. We need you to figure out every possible way that you can free up time, to recruit your friends also, to help our progressives up and down the ballot. We've got Janet Protasewicz. We've got Jody Habish-Sinkin. We've got Corey Mason and Eric Jenrich. Up and down the ballot, there are progressives. District 8 has a special legislative election. So April 4th special election determines whether the GOP number ticks up to 22 in that legislature or if it becomes a little bit more fair, 21 12 to 12. Uh, again, that District 8 candidate is Jody Habish Sinkin. Her opponent is also named Dan and he has fierce competition in that district, which is redistricted in red. And if the Republicans get a two thirds supermajority at that Senate level, they're gonna have the votes to override Governor Evers veto power. I cannot express how important that is. He's our only line of defense in the state assembly. They're two votes short of a supermajority. This could push us over the iceberg and it's too narrow of a margin. And what are we gonna do? We're not gonna let Wisconsin get double dan. So you have the power and use it. We need you to tell every Scani how to vote. I'm going to put some info in the chat box right now. Uh, maybe. There is our website. Please go to it to find information on how to vote, how to ballot request, how to, you know, what exactly is going on, even how to F lob. If you did not get your ballot or if you have not registered, you only have until the 30th, two more days to register and you've already registered to request your 2023 ballot, it might not come in time if you're requesting today or tomorrow. Please fill out that FWAB. And uh, follow us and contact us. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we are always available by email. We are in every corner of the world, so someone will answer you. Uh, you need something to really motivate you, watch our event with Professor Howard Schwaver, uh, co-sponsored by this Progressive Caucus. And then check mobilized messages from today and keep an e eye out for other emails and mobilized messaging require <clears throat> regarding an end of March call-a-thon being developed by our chair and WISDEM's chair, Ben Wickler. Again, your actions right now, this very week, prevent racist redistricting and a total ban on abortions in Wisconsin. We can and we must get Wisconsinites to vote for justices who will uphold the right to vote both at home and abroad. So thank you for your time and on Wisconsin. On Wisconsin, that's right. And on with climate change mitigation, that's right. We're going to do the right thing because we have such great DA members like Angela Fobbs, Liz Blackburn and all of you on this call. Thank you for sticking with us for these 90 minutes. And let's uh, go the rest of the way together for social security expansion, equal opportunity for all of us, a planet that we can live on and a state of Wisconsin spreading out fairness all over the Midwest and the United States from coast to coast. With that, we're going to end the meeting. Thank you, everybody, again.